back to the action and turning to question 13, look at the call of the question. If the owner brings a negligence action against the movers for allowing the antique anvil to fall, he can recover a nominal damages. Okay, that's wrong. Nominal damages are not available in negligence. They're available in a lot of other theories, but not negligence. B, punitive damages. Okay, that's wrong too, because we know that punitive damages are unavailable in a negligence action as well. C, both nominal damages and punitive damages. Okay, well, we know that's also wrong for the same reasons that A and B are wrong. And so we get to D, neither nominal damages nor punitive damages. We can pick D before we even read the fact pattern. This is one of those questions where if you read carefully and know the law, you don't even need the facts. But, okay, so we're all sure it's D. Let's read the facts just to make sure. Owner of a collection of old anvils <laughs> lent it to the local museum and hired pro movers to transport the anvils to the second floor, where they'd be displayed. Movers use the rope and pulley, and while one of the largest anvils is being lifted, it slipped and fell, crashing to the ground. However, however, the anvil was not even bent. Okay, so there's been a clear act of negligence established by race, but no damages. So, if the negligence action is brought, uh, he can recover. Okay, nominal damages is still wrong for the reason it was before, and so is punitive, and so is C, and D becomes the correct answer by acclamation. Move on next to question 14. Got another mover problem here. If the owner brings a claim for negligent infliction of emotional distress against the tenant, she would a recover because she suffered physical symptoms uh, from her distress. Potentially correct. B, recover because she was a foreseeable plaintiff. Also potentially correct. C, not recover because she was not within the zone of danger. Also potentially correct. And then D, not recover because she suffered no physical impact. Less likely to be correct, but also all, all potentially correct. D, probably the most likely to be incorrect without looking at the facts. Move to the facts, let's have a look. The owner of a valuable painting hired pro movers to transport it to an auction house when she decided to sell it. The movers are carrying it to their van. A window air conditioner that a tenant had been trying to install fell out of the second floor window and crashed through the painting onto the ground. The owner had been watching from her apartment complex across the street and saw her painting destroyed. Okay, she's not in the zone of danger, right? She's across the street. It's foreseeable she'd be upset, but not in a way that's compensable under these facts. So she's upset, suffered uh, medical, uh, needed medical treatment for shock. Okay, great. So she brings a claim for NIED against the tenant, person who dropped that air conditioner. She's not going to recover because the tenant didn't breach a duty directly owed to her, really. So look, A, recover because of physical symptoms? Well, no, that's not good enough under these facts. Recover because she was a foreseeable plaintiff? Also not good enough. Not recover because she's not within the zone of danger? That's accurate, that looks good. But let's look at D. D, not recover because she suffered no physical impact. Okay, that's wrong. Because if she was in the zone of danger, she'd be able to recover and she still wouldn't be hit. So we can eliminate D as being incorrect as an application of law. And so C becomes the best answer because it's the most precise and it's the one <clears throat> that most clearly ties the facts and the law together. This is a hard question, I think, but a good one. Any issues with it? Any, uh, and not unreasonably because we've got a plaintiff who's really hurt. But here's where we get to see a very important lesson that we'll see again in crimes more than once and all the other subjects. Just because somebody's sympathetic doesn't mean they win. All the time we get people who are really hurt, who really suffer harm, and they lose. Welcome to the real world and the last step of the socializing process where we are turned into heartless monsters. Yes. I don't, I don't I don't remember the, uh, the 
zone of danger? Okay, this was the, there were a couple of cases. In California, the key case is called Dillon versus Leg, and it's a case where mom is walking across the street with a child. Child is hit. Okay, mom's in the zone of danger. It's totally foreseeable. Therefore, NIED claim, mother not physically struck, but does suffer emotional distress, is injured legally per the statute. Now, what makes this a little different is it's a tangible physical object that's hurt rather than a person, which is one additional reason why there would not be a recovery allowed in this case. But they're not asking us about this. They're asking us about this zone of danger issue in this context. So this is a lousy clay case for the plaintiff for several reasons. But the reason that we're focusing on here is the zone of danger issue. So now let's turn to question 15. Another weak call of the question. The plaintiff may sue the defendant if he can show the defendant acted out of malice. May be true. B. Sue the defendant if he can show the defendant he did not believe the allegation to be true. Also potentially true. C. Not sue the defendant because the accusation is absolutely privileged. Not very common, but potentially true. D. Not sue the defendant if the defendant prevailed in the original action because of the doctrine of collateral estoppel. All right. Collateral estoppel is a civil procedure rule called issue preclusion as opposed to claim preclusion, which is race judicata. And it's totally reasonable for a Civ Pro question to be on the regular bar. So for them to give us a Civ Pro answer pick in a question that turns out to be a torts question, completely foreseeable and nothing to be too worried about. But also, it's the rest of the calls have nothing to do with civil procedure. So this one is either the correct answer or a terrible answer. Let's look at the facts. During an action for breach of contract, so we've got a Civ Pro answer pick, and the first line makes us think we're being tested on contracts. The defendant testified in court that she withheld shipment of goods because the plaintiff defrauded her. The plaintiff now wishes to sue the defendant for defamation because he can establish this testimony was false. All right? So it's not a breach of contract action. It's a fraud action with the allegation of the defamatory statement having been made during trial. We know that statements made during trial are absolutely privileged, totally privileged. Okay, that makes answer pick C jump off the page. That's the obviously correct answer. Because you can testify falsely in court, you're guilty of perjury, but you're not liable for defamation because you can say anything you want without being worried about that consequence. There are other consequences to testifying falsely, including perjury and also not being believed and losing as a result. Uh, but for purposes of civil tort liability for defamation, absolute privilege applies to the words you say in court, and that makes C the best answer. Now we turn to question 16. If the minister sues the newspaper for invasion of privacy and establishes the above facts, he likely will, okay, we don't know what the above facts are, kind of hard, A, prevail, because the photo made it appear as if he was exiting an adult bookstore. Okay, well, if he wasn't really exiting a bookstore, that's potentially a false light showing, I guess. B, prevail, because the newspaper made a public disclosure of a private fact, also potentially true. We've got to look at uh, what those facts are. C, not prevail because he was on a public sidewalk when the photo was taken. Okay, now we're sort of thinking about that earlier question that we had a look at, where the mapping service took a picture of somebody in public, not liable for public disclosure of private facts, because the person was in public. Uh, so C might be a good pick. D, not prevail because he has not alleged any economic or pecuniary damages. Well, those are not always required in invasion of privacy torts. So, D is probably not a very good answer. Let's go to the top. Local entertainment section publishes a story on the business district with random pictures. A minister on the sidewalk in front of a bookstore says that the camera angle makes it look like he's exiting the bookstore. So, 
be suing for invasion of privacy, it would be false light. Not public disclosure of private facts, not commercial appropriation, not intrusion into seclusion. So, if he establishes those facts, A looks like the right answer. He wins because the photo makes it appear as if he's something he's not. Yes. Ah, but B misstates the facts. B says the newspaper made a public disclosure of a private fact, but they didn't. And because he didn't actually leave the adult bookstore. Okay, that's the attitude I want you to have about the multi-state. Right there. Not fear. Just say, oh yeah, there they go again. Those clowns. Okay, they're playing you for a sucker. They're not smarter than you, okay? That's a lesson we will see over, in case you, by the way, you know that already. Uh, okay, move to question 17. If the executive sues the pilot for damage to his airplane and prevails, it will be because, A, a reasonable pilot would not have flown that day. Maybe correct. Oh, he wins. Okay, maybe A. B, a pilot with the same age, education, and experience would not have flown that day. Okay. We don't judge pilots based on experience. We judge them based on they're competent or not competent. So A looks like a better answer than B. C, it was not necessary for the pilot to fly that day. Okay, A is a better answer than C, for sure. D, the flying of a plane by a 14-year-old is an inherently dangerous activity, and the pilot is strictly liable. Well, that's wrong. That's a misstatement of law. We don't need to read the fact pattern. We know A is the right pick, just based on a close reading of the picks and the question. Um, but let's look at the facts anyway, just to make sure that we're not just uh, blowing smoke. Um, Fourteen-year-old, the youngest licensed pilot in the state, foggy day, pilots advised to fly only if necessary. Pilot took the plane out, wanted to fly over the football field, tries to land, Run out the run runway. Okay, so it's common negligence. A is the correct answer. We don't care about B for the same reasons we didn't care about it before. C is actually kind of an interesting pick, but it's focusing on the facts rather than the law, and the law settles this matter. D, the flying of a plane, inherently dangerous. That's false. We know that too. And then finally, we turn to question 18, the last of the pack and our last for the evening, looking at the call of the question. If the teenager brings an action against the landowner to recover damages for his injuries, he will, A, prevail because the landowner may not use a vicious dog to protect only his property. Well, maybe so. That's a correct statement of law. B, prevail because the landowner is strictly liable for injuries caused by the vicious dog, potentially correct also. C, not prevail because the teenager was trespassing on the landowner's property, also potentially correct, but we know that trespassing is not a great, uh, a great defense for landowners in a number of cases. D, not prevail because the landowner had posted signs warning about the dog. Also potentially correct. Remember, we saw a couple of dog bite cases where the fact that there was a sign posted, in fact, was a valid defense. So let's look at these facts. A 16-year-old teenager playing baseball in a sandlot, ball hit over his head into a landowner's adjacent property. Ignoring beware of dog signs, the teenager climbed over the fence into the landowner's yard to retrieve the ball, the ball and was attacked by a vicious guard dog belonging to the landowner. Dog bit the teenager, causing him to suffer severe lacerations, required numerous stitches. Okay, should this teenager win? Let's just think about it apart from the questions. I say the teenager should win because this dog looks to me like a spring gun. It looks like this dog is there just to hurt people. It would be different if it said, warning, aware of dog, 
and it was a family dog that flipped out or something like that, or other facts were present. But it's clear this person put a vicious dog in the backyard just to protect the backyard. There's no facts in here about having been the victim of burglaries in the past, blah, 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 other stuff that might justify this dog being there. We get just these straight facts. And um, so A looks like the best pick, but let's look at the other answers. B, prevail because the landowner is strictly liable. That looks like a good answer, too, but we don't know any facts about the dog's prior incidents. Strict liability looks good, but it isn't a better answer than A. C, not prevail because trespassing, that's a losing answer under the facts. Not prevail because posted signs, that's the one I wanted to play. I thought, well, the landowner's been reasonable by posting a warning. However, you can't use a warning sign to get away from something that's more dangerous than reasonable. And thus, A becomes the clear, correct answer. Yes? Yes. Pick B. Pick B is an exact statement of, of the law of strict liability. But A is a better answer because it interprets the facts of this question more precisely. So what the owner did wrong was use a vicious guard dog to guard property only. He's also strictly liable for it. But, so when you correct something like that, yes. you have always used, you have, uh, Okay. The, as far as the actual grading is concerned? Okay, for our purposes, we're just keeping track of right versus wrong, and we're going to do a pre- and a post-test with a couple of years break between. On the actual exam, you're graded correct answers only. Minus, you do not get negative points for getting it wrong. So, the idea is finish as many questions as you can. Typically, if you get sharp at this, you'll be able to work a little faster than 1.8 per minute per question, and that will give you a little cushion. As I became better at doing this myself, one of the things that I did was I marked questions that I wanted to go back and have a second look at. The party line, and what I believe in, is go with your first impression. Don't go back and change answers unless you're sure you know you made a mistake and you can say what you did. But I do think that it's appropriate to recognize some of these questions were pretty easy. You could answer them without reading the fact pattern and be pretty sure that we're right. If, there, if three things are wrong, obviously, and one is not wrong, it'll be the right answer. But there will be other questions like that one. The hardest one in this path, I think, is that one about landowner liability for the boy who's also collecting the ball that went over the fence. Because you've really got to know the law and you must read carefully. That wraps up what I expect will be our longest class of the summer. When we get back together in two nights, we're going to focus on contracts. We'll do the same basic thing we did tonight, two packs of nine. I'll introduce the material briefly to begin with, and we will have yet another winning session.